Hi there! Welcome back to RimWorld Alcohol Empire, Episode 5. Today's tale is one of shock and awe. Let's get started, shall we? In the beginning of today's episode, we're cutting down a lot of trees and removing a lot of stumps so that we have plenty of wood. Now why do we need plenty of wood, Rat Knight? This isn't a logging empire. Well, my good viewer, we are going to be building something. Yes, it is finally time we build a proper food storage and dining area. Unfortunately though, in the middle of building our brand new dining hall, Baby Oakley, as well as Blitz, have both caught malaria. It's very unfortunate. I was very nervous about poor Baby Oakley catching malaria because, well, she's a baby, and obviously her immune system isn't near as strong as Blitz. But lucky for us, we have the best doctor in all the land, good old dynamite-wielding Uncle Reek. With his help, Baby Oakley, as well as Blitz, both developed immunity. And in the middle of building our new dining hall, we had a meteorite of granite fall right next to it. It was only a few feet away from it. But thankfully there was no damage and everyone was okay. Sometime later we had baby Oakley finally old enough that she could walk around. She wasn't a baby anymore, she was a toddler. Aww. She could finally begin contributing with her family around the bootlegging empire. We also began building some nice cooking equipment like a, a hanging pot and a, a little kitchen setup in the new dining hall. That way we could feed our populace properly. And I must say, it turned out wonderful. It looks very homely and quaint and just comfortable. I could take a little nap in the corner and feel perfectly safe. But the dining hall wasn't the only good news I had for you. Turns out Tree is pregnant again. Oh my god, the family tree, the bloodline continues. Ah, what a beautiful day and a beautiful thing to hear of. Sometime later, however, on a foggy morning, we had a combat supplier come by. We didn't trade any weapons to them, but we did trade them plenty of vodka and beer in exchange for some silver. We also bought some Molotovs and also another cavalry sword. Sometime later, under the mountain, I decided to open up the area that we were using as food storage, and this was brought to me, of course, by a comment left by Artemis Alphaling, our good friend, saying that the base, of course, is looking good, but we do need a dedicated room and whatnot for alcohol production, as well as the stockpile, etc., etc. So that's what we're going to begin working on here. And we're also working on some beautiful benches around the city as well as some hanging lamps so that we can see while traveling through our newly founded city at night. And of course by this point we had a very good stockpile of alcohol, the majority of it just being normal beer of course, but that's going to rake in a lot of money for us and if the settlers have anything for us to buy then of course we can use that to purchase things as well. While the caravan was gone we had a warg hunting tree, but of course this went about as well for the warg as you could imagine. In other words, we stomped the shit out of it with guns. Not too long after that though, the caravan returned and we had many interesting items that they had traded. Um, I say many, but realistically we only had two polar bear rugs and we ended up buying a dog. This dog was a Yorkshire Terrier, I named it Smokey and it was a gift for Bacchus and Saburo. Speaking of gifts, we did get the polar bear rugs for Shortus's and Tree's children, Lucky, Oakley, and the new baby that has not been named yet. And in the meantime, Tree decided to commission a worker barracks be built, that way everyone had their very own home. Well, at least a home that they could share together. We also began working on mortars for added protection to our new empire. Because as it stands, without the mortars, we have no way of firing at any enemies across Silverhorn Mountain. We also had Blitz build a gorgeous blue fur bed for our new buddy Smokey in Bacchus and Saburo's home. Unfortunately though things were not all sunshine and rainbows, we had a massive group of Thromboian tribes people who were going to come and raid us. They were going to prepare for a while, try and strategize and then attack, which gave us plenty of time to load up our mortar and begin taking shots at them. Now the fortress mortar was somewhat inaccurate and for the most part we did miss the majority of our shots, but at one point we did manage to get a hit on the enemy. 
But surprisingly enough, during this time, we had a massive group of manhunting bunny rabbits enter the area, and they went uh, somewhat for the enemy, the rest came for us, and I was hoping that this would totally defeat the Thromboians. Spoiler, it doesn't at all, and they cut through these bunnies like butter, and then began making their way towards our mountain. And we were unable to fire more mortar shells at them, one because we ran out of mortar shells, but also because of the bunny rabbits at our door. If we were to open that up, they would begin coming in and attacking us. Luckily though, the rabbits have weakened the Thromboians just enough that when we came out of the brewery and started firing at them, there weren't too many of them left. Bacchus began chasing down any last members and firing at them with her hunting rifle. We also found one who had some decent skills in front of Tree's home and we decided to take her as a prisoner and try to recruit her. Which became frustrating very quick because she constantly went berserk and we'd have to beat her back into submission. Sometime later, after the raid, Saburo ended up catching gutworms. Now, there is a racist stereotype that Thromboians actually carry gutworms, so people were thinking maybe it was from the raiders. Bacchus, of course, disputed this and said she, of course, is a Thromboian, but I will let you know that Saburo and Bacchus have been making love in that house, and she could have given him gutworms. Shortus also brought this up at the Decemberary Fest in the dining hall, and Bacchus was none too pleased. The two began a fist fight, right? in the middle of the dining hall at the party. I'm sure Shortus is living everyone's dream of fist fighting one of your in-laws at a family gathering, but this is not okay, not for the alcohol empire. Late one evening, Tree and some of the other bootleggers gathered and kind of hatched a bit of an idea. You know, we're always trading this alcohol, but why not instead of trading it for once, we gather up a lot of the alcohol and some other things and take to the Red Cove settlement and offer it as a gift. That way we could finally have peace and neutrality with them. So that's exactly what we did. We sent out Reek and a few others and we ended up offering them a good bit of whiskey, some beer, and we also offered them a muffalo that self-tamed off camera. And this was enough to please them, and they were now neutral with us, thankfully. They weren't friends exactly, but on the way to being that. However, while the caravan was gone, one of our bootleggers spotted in the dark what looked to be some mega spiders trotting around, but these were no mega spiders. This was a Thromboian death squad. These Thromboians are elite warrior assassins who actually wear the corpses of mega spiders as armor. And though a lot of the weapons that they carry are normal bows or knives or something of that sort, they also always carry at least one mega spider weapon with them at all times, which is kind of a symbolic weapon they use. All these factors together ranking them very high on the scale of can they beat the shit out of us. Lucky for us, one of our bootleggers managed to catch a glimpse of them out in the dark, and we had Bacchus's expertise to tell us that those were no mega spiders, those were actually elite assassins coming here to most likely assassinate Tree as she is our leader. And luckily, because of this, we managed to catch them out in the open before they even made it to town. If it wasn't for that, we most likely would have died or at least lost Tree due to an assassination. But the Thromboians, as we've seen, are not ones to give up. They'll be back in much higher numbers with much more elite warriors to kill us. Realistically, the only thing we can do is just try to prepare for a much larger attack. Maybe we try to build some city walls. Maybe we try to build some new weapons like uh, researching Gatling guns or something like that and keep our cannons and our mortars stocked. Our Thromboian prisoner also went berserk once again, beating down the door to her prison cell. Luckily though, Saburo met her out in the wheat field with his pistols and quickly downed her. A few days later, I think the Thromboian death squad really made us realize that we do need some city walls. If this was going to become an alcohol empire, empires have walls to protect them. So that's exactly what we began working on, was a massive sandstone wall to the east to try and protect us from raids, sieges, things like that. The wall would take a very long time to construct though, and in the meantime, we had a little bit of a family hunting trip. So Lucky, Oakley, Tree, and Shortus all went on a family hunting trip after a mega sloth to put some meat in our food baskets. Not only was this an attempt, of course, to show Oakley how to hunt, but it was also an attempt to show Oakley the sense of community that we have and that not only killing this animal is for sport or anything, but it's also for feeding the community. 
Tree and Shortest quickly showed Oakley how to finish off the animal in the most humane way possible. Well, they shot it in the head. It was fairly humane. They, of course, quickly carried it back home, where Tree would then butcher it for Oakley, and they had a little bit of a surprise in store for her. They decided that her grandmother, Bacchus, should probably stuff the head and mount it on a nice piece of oak and give to Oakley as a present for her very first hunt. Truly a beautiful moment. Unfortunately, though, this beautiful moment would be cut short as we had a massive raid from the RimWorld Marshal Service. I believe this may be the largest one yet. And not only that, they apparently have a sheriff leading the charge. His name was Sheriff Ed, and he was packing two heavy revolvers. Now, this may not be too interesting to you guys, but the majority of the Marshal Service normally doesn't have that great of weaponry as they're very underfunded, thus of course why bootleggers like us can pop up anywhere and they hardly can do anything about it. But the fact that they've actually sent a sheriff means that our operation is becoming a massive problem for them, which rightfully so, we are truly on our way to becoming an empire. But that does mean that more people such as Sheriff Ed will be coming to stop us. Since our wall wasn't finished just yet, they were easily able to infiltrate our city and they began firing upon us. They began surrounding us through the city streets. Sheriff Ed even managed to take down Tree. She was alive though, thankfully, but Shortest was enraged by this and began charging at Sheriff Ed with his cavalry sword. Unfortunately, he too was quickly defeated by Sheriff Ed. Reek popped out with his shotgun and began firing at him, but Unfortunately, Reek was also defeated. He had died. Sheriff Ed's rampage through our city and through our bootleggers was ended swiftly by White Lightning. Yes, our trusted companion of all the creatures was able to kill him. And we were very thankful that White Lightning did manage to pull this off because without their leader, the other coward officers began to flee. We did manage to injure or kill many of them as they were running away from our town, but not near as many as we would have liked. There were many survivors, and they, of course, also will be back in much larger numbers, no doubt. But victory, of course, does not come without a price, especially when you're fighting the RimWorld Marshal Service. Though they are a bunch of underfunded fools, they do have plenty of manpower. Even without the firepower, they are extremely dangerous, and when you get on their radar like we have, this type of thing is what happens. And of course, our Thromboian prisoner once again decided to go berserk, bust down her door, but this time, we were just so tired of fighting with her, we shot her down so she couldn't do harm to anyone else, and if she lived, she lived. If she didn't, she didn't. We began tending to White Lightning, the true hero here, and making sure Lucky and Oakley were both safe. Saburo also ended up getting an infection in one of his arms from the battle. And just in case that wasn't enough drama and entertainment for you, Tree then went into labor, and I was over here shitting bricks as most people are very injured. Reek, our best doctor, had died during battle, so Blitz was the only one that was fit to deliver the baby. Blitz, of course, carried Tree into the other room where he had more room to work with and began the process of this. And thank God, Tree and the baby were both perfectly safe, that no complications or anything like that, so we have a new healthy baby boy. I was a bit puzzled on names for a little while, and I realized that good old Uncle Reek would pass his name down to this baby boy as a testament of his sacrifice. Blitz also had the honor of carrying his good old dynamite-wielding friend to his final resting place. We decided to create a bit of a colonist graveyard up north of Silverhorn Mountain just before the tunnels of the mountain begins and that way we would have a safe place to store our dead as casualties are bound to happen in an empire like this. But losing our poor Reek would not be the end but a new beginning and he has hopefully went on to a, a better afterlife if you will. So, something where the alcohol flows off the mountains and there is no prohibition or <laughs> Rimworld Marshal Service. Just a beautiful place, right? Uh, kind of like the song Candy Mountain, the Big Rock Candy Mountain, if you know what I'm talking about. That, that's kind of what I have in my head for um, where Reek has went now that he's died. Uh, just a, a wonderful paradise of, you know, what he loved and that sort of thing. So that's, that's kind of what I like to envision. I do want to mention with you guys, we did have a poll recently on the channel about whether or not we should introduce some electricity into the series. Um, and of course, you know, we had a pretty outstanding yes to that instead of no. Um, you know, more yays than nays, of course. So we are going to try to implement that, I think, in next episode. 
Um, I do want to reassure everyone we're not going to be doing turrets and kill boxes and you know all that stuff. Just basic electronics. Um, I might, uh, might add some industrial era mods for some um, record players. Um, let me think, uh, you know, for the uh, like gas lights or something, you know, stuff like that that can run on electricity. Um, we already have a wooden windmill kind of thing we can use to generate electricity. We may also use wood fired generators, coal fire, um, maybe even alcohol fire. I've seen a lot of good comments about that. Um, if there is such a thing, we may try and do that if it kind of fits the aesthetic of what we're going for here as well, you know, the look of it and whatnot. And of course, once we add these mods that we're talking about, they will also be in the mod list in the uh, description of each video, of course, as they are currently. Um, you know, there's a, there's a really good mod. I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, once we add it, of course, or if we add it, I'll, of course, mention it in the video. Um, but there's one that adds, I think, a, a telegraph, so you can actually communicate with other places through that. Um, there's always been a um, kind of like a bonfire mod you can add. We use that in our Yield Night series. Um, and you can communicate with different settlements and factions that way, but I, I don't know. I kind of prefer a telegram, obviously, for this, as, you know, it kind of fits with the times. You know, we're kind of in a industrial age. Honestly, Prohibition in the United States would have been uh, 1910s? I'm probably wrong. <laughs> but, like, 1910s, 1920s, something like that, right? I think the 20s? I have no idea. I forget. But anyhow... Um, you know, with that, I don't really think we're in that era here, like that exact time period, because I kind of want the next series to kind of feature some maybe World War One or World War Two weapons. So I guess we could be in the 1920s kind of thing. I don't know. I'm still kind of figuring it out. And with that as well, I want to mention, I think it was last episode, I changed the time and the date. Um, or just the date to 23 years in the future, and nobody called me out on this. I guess nobody noticed. I didn't until last night. I was sitting um, on my couch watching a TV show, and I realized somehow <laughs> we went 23 years in the future from uh, 5500, the year 5500, when realistically we should have went from 5505 because that is when the logging empire fell. So I'm going to try to make a correction to that for episode 6. Uh, I'm going to mention it here. I don't think I'm going to bring it up again because uh, shit on it, who cares, right? I, I hate constantly bringing that up. But I do apologize for doing that. Um, I just want to say that we are going to correct that. I just want to have a proper calendar and whatnot. And I'd like to do a timeline video at some point as well. I'm constantly trying to come up with in my head like what should the next series be on down with like in terms of like advancing in the future um, you know how can we bring the other characters into this tie everything together I've also been thinking of maybe like a prequel series I feel like that wouldn't be as interesting um, I feel like that would kind of be its own standalone that people could enjoy and not know that it's tied to this universe um, of course though I'm sure there's ways of you know do the best of both worlds of course I just kind of suck sometimes so I don't <laughs> don't know always how to go about doing that just like with changing the time I'm dog shit at that apparently um but yeah a lot of a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline hopefully um but I just want to thank you guys ever so much for watching I love you guys I really appreciate everything and I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next one goodbye guys